Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning evangelistic service. Um, I'm glad that you can join us this morning, um, Sunday. <laughs> I trust and pray you had a wonderful day yesterday and that you had a great night's rest and you were energized for the week ahead. We give God thanks and praise for his goodness towards us and uh, we're grateful to be in the land of the living. All right. I haven't been able to recognize who's on yet. I see, I can see through the mirror that people are coming on. I want to welcome you. I will get a chance to do so um, after we sing uh, the meditation song. This morning, we are going to be continuing with uh, the topic baptism that we started last Sunday. All right? So we are going to finish uh, uh, the topic on baptism that we began last Sunday. So I pray that you have your Bibles, you have your uh, pen and your paper that you can write down the scriptures so that you can go back and study for yourself. The whole idea is to get you to become an independent studier of the word, not dependent on any human being or any human agency. Your dependence must be on the spirit of God alone. And so that's what we are trying to foster here at One Accord Christian Service Movement. All right. Um, I want to say to you that on Tuesday night, we'll be back here uh, with Evangelism 101, and we will be studying the seal of God. The seal of God. What does the Bible say the seal, or who? Let me, let me, let me uh, paraphrase, rephrase that. Who does the Bible emphatically tell us the seal of God is? Okay? So we are going to come back on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock and we are going to have a study on the seal of God, a Bible study not a general study it's going to be a Bible study whatever the Bible says is what we are going to accept okay, praise God for that um, I uh, I'm going to go ahead and have our opening prayer and then we are going to get ready to present God's word uh, to, uh, through the power of his Holy Spirit. Okay? So uh, let us bow our heads for prayer, after which we will have the meditation song, and then we will um, go into the spoken word for this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for you know, your bountiful, manifold blessings. We can't remember, we can't count, but we receive them and we are grateful for them. So we say thank you. This morning, Lord, we thank you for waking us up in our right minds and bringing us here where we can again worship you and listen to you speak to us through uh, your word. We pray that we will incline our ear and that we will receive what you're saying. May transform our lives and, 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 and soften our hearts. May the throne of our heart become your dwelling place. And may you transform us and mold us and fashion us after the similitude of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be with every viewer. I, 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 I pray that you will bless them and keep them, provide for them and protect them as they embark on this new week. Help us all to have a wonderful week. And where the challenges may arise in situations uh, that are adverse show up, we pray that we will depend on you to direct us and guide us through the maze. Bless, Lord, and keep us, we pray. At this time, I want to lift up Nisha. Yesterday, we prayed for her, Lord, but I couldn't remember her name. Her name is Nisha in England, who has been um, uh, stricken with illness. Lord, you are the great physician. Uh, good news came yesterday evening that, you know, she is recovering nicely. May she continue, Lord, as she bask under uh, your mighty wings. May the healing radiate from it into her being and restore her to perfect health and strength and return her to her family. Be with everybody else, those who are hurting because of death in their family or those that are suffering because of lack or illness. Lord, I pray you come by near and touch them and restore them and bless them. Lord, I want to pray for a special friend of mine whose name I will not mention, who is depending on you this morning to prove yourself to her. She's going for, a, for an apartment. She just found out that this is her last week on her job. So she's trusting you to provide the apartment 
and the new job so that she can support herself and pay for that apartment. You are God. You are faithful. And you have promised when we trust you, when we cannot trace you, that you will open the windows of heaven and pour us out blessings. Lord, we thank you for what you are going to do with her today. We thank you for giving her that apartment today and for the job that you are going to provide so that she can pay for that apartment, supply herself and her family with their needs, and also return to your cause. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We adore you. You alone are God and worthy to be praised. And so, Lord, all our praise, all our worship, all our honor goes to you. Be with us now. And Lord, as I uh, get ready to present your word, may your spirit take full control from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. And may he orchestrate everything that transpires in this exercise, in this service. For your name, your honor, and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, we are going to uh, have our meditation song now, and then we are going to we are going to go into uh, the spoken word. Okay, we are going to have our meditation song now. Breathe on me. and praise for the words of that beautiful song. This morning we are going to be focused on baptism. Last week you remember we talked about water baptism and we uh, gave you the worldly meaning of the term baptism. We told you how it was done. We also help you understand from the scripture what the, the spiritual meaning of baptism actually is. We use the words of Jesus in the book of John chapter 3. And we read from verse 3 to 8. All right. Jesus said, except a man be born again of water and the spirit. We explained to you that water baptism denoted the death of the sinner and the resurrection of a new creature. It was not a purification process. It was a regeneration process. All right? It was a new birth, a new creation, a new person. The first person was a human being after the similitude of Adam who lived by the flesh 
and the second person was a spirit being born after the similitude of the second Adam Christ who is a spirit being. The Bible makes that abundantly clear from the words of Jesus in John chapter 3 verse um, 3 to 8. And then the Apostle Paul helped us understand it further when in 2 uh, Corinthians he told us that I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 that the person that is baptized into Christ is a new creation. All right? A new creature. All things are passed away. The old man of sin is dead. He's passed away. And all things have been made, been made new. The new person is new through and through. He's a new spirit being. All right? And so, um, we continue to, 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 to give you scriptures to help you understand that for one who is baptized or born again, they have to submit to the spirit of God. You know, we use Mark chapter 1, 9 to 13. We saw Jesus' submission to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit directing him into the wilderness. An experience that the flesh don't like. An experience that the flesh do not enjoy. In fact, the wilderness experience is the kind of experience that kills the flesh. It mortifies the flesh. So the Spirit understanding that although we have been dead to sin, we are alive in Christ and the flesh still attempts to take control. So what he does after baptism is directs us into a wilderness experience. So the flesh can be mortified. You see? And that's what happened with Jesus. Jesus, our example. He said, follow me. And if we follow him, then we will make it to glory. So this is the example he set. Good. All right. We also kind of read in Hebrews that Jesus, by his example and by his life, he and his death, rather, his life, his, his life, his death, and his new life, all right, his new spirit life, um, consecrated a new and living way for you and I to live. That's found in Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 26. There is a new way to live. We cannot be baptized and still continue living the old way. There is a new and living way. That word living way means that it is possible in you and through you and I by Christ in us. His spirit in us propelling us to do his will, to obey his commands and to reflect him in all that we do. Of course we know it can only be done by the spirit. Good. So, that's water baptism. And we adequately, I think, broke it down last week. If you missed last week, go back to our YouTube page and look for the, um, the video that says baptism from last week. Last week Sunday. And you will get the whole sermon. Today, we are going to continue. Jesus said you must be baptized by water and the Spirit. Last week, we focused on water baptism. This week, we are going to focus on the Spirit baptism. Let's look at John 1.33. John 1.33. Book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, I just want to welcome this morning. Um, I saw some people on there. I want to welcome Sister Frida Richardson down there in Anguilla. Sister Thea Charles in um, Houston, Texas. Sister Cecilia Louisa and her husband Irving down there in St. Lucia. Uh, Sister Maggie down there in St. Lucia. And Sister v Vanessa Lunkada out there in New Jersey. Welcome, my dear brethren. Thanks for joining us this morning. All right? So let's go to John chapter 1, verse 33. And the Bible says, And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Good. So John says, listen, I just baptize him with water. But I was told that the one that cometh, you understand me? And upon whom I see the Spirit of God descendeth, descending, sorry, and it remains on him, he is the one that will baptize you all with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and I bear record 
that this is the Son of God. So, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, baptized by John, the one upon whom the Spirit descended and remained. He was anointed by the Spirit. The Bible tells us in Luke, I think it is, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. To preach, to teach, to heal, to resurrect by the Spirit. The one on whom the Spirit descended and remained. Oh, brethren, I wish the Spirit of God could descend upon all of us and remain. I wish the Spirit of God could descend upon all of us and remain. See? So, brethren, what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit that John is talking about in reference to Jesus here in John chapter 1 verse 33? What is it? You see, during water baptism, one's body is immersed in the water for an instant. The water covers the person's entire being. There is complete submersion. Uh, and, and, uh, what's that, what's that, what it it's an indication, sorry. It's an indication that the person is dead and buried. Complete immersion. We discussed that last week. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the same thing. You become filled, saturated with the Holy Spirit until it covers every part of your being and you become one with the Holy Spirit. You see, you get submerged in the water to signify death. When you, are, when you come up, you become submerged or saturated with the Holy Spirit to indicate that you are a new creature and you are following a new master. Is that clear? The Bible makes that very clear to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. It makes that abundantly clear. All right? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, He or she that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He or she that is joined unto God is one spirit. How do we get joined unto God? Via the new birth experience, the born again experience, baptism of water. Once you come up out of the water, the spirit saturates you. He enters you. He fills every crevice, every nook, every cranny of your being. He takes over. And you become one with him and he with you. The Bible says in Colossians 3.3, 3, For we are dead, dead to our sins and our trespasses. We've been buried in the watery grave of baptism and the life we now live is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3 3. Write these scriptures down and go back, take a look at them. Now you by yourself can't really do much. When it comes to spiritual things, in fact, there's nothing we can do. Absolutely nothing. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. Our goodness makes God hold his nose and turn his head. It stinks up the place. Our righteousness does. So there is not anything we can do. But the Holy Spirit of God, through you and I, can do mighty miracles. Philippians 4.13 I, you, can do all things through Christ. <laughs> Who gives us the strength by his Spirit. Praise the Lord. When you see someone being healed, it has nothing to do with the person laying the hands on them or the person praying for them. It is all the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through that person to the victim of sickness and sin. I want you to get that. Okay? We walk around talking about this one healed and that one healed. Nobody healed. Not even Jesus healed. It was the Spirit of God in Jesus that healed it is the Spirit that provides the action. The Bible says He spake, God did, and it was done. He said the Spirit moved upon the waters and brought about the separation. The Spirit is the one doing what God commands. 
When he is in you and you are obedient to God and you call on his name on behalf of somebody who is sick or somebody who is suffering or somebody who has a situation where they are under the attack of the evil one and God comes through, it's not you. It is the spirit in you that provides the power to negate Satan's plan. That's why God has called upon us to accept the dynamite power of his spirit. Unfortunately, in the Christian church today, we go to university, we go to school, we come back as preachers and pastors, and we want executive power. We want the corner office. We want to be able to tell people what to do. We want to be the president. God didn't call us to be presidents. God didn't call us to be executives. He called us to be servants, filled with his spirit, so that when we speak, when we call on his name, his spirit within us will act and bomb Satan and his minions out of the lives of those he's possessing. I want you to understand, brethren, in the Christian church today, we have taken the power of the spirit and attempted to make a mockery of it. But for those of us who are listening today, I pray that changes. Those who listen to this sermon, I pray that changes. The Bible tells us in Luke 8, 46. Turn there with me. Luke chapter 8, verse 46. Luke chapter 8, verse 46. And it says there, And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. When the woman with the issue of blood crawled on the ground and got close to Jesus and made contact with Jesus, her period stopped. It had been flowing for 12 straight years and near doctor in her day, in her town or the surrounding towns could stop it. But the Spirit of God emanating from Jesus with all power and authority over any and everything Satan had laid upon God's fallen children, when Jesus was touched, the spirit moved out into that woman and stopped the flow. And Jesus testified of it. He said, somebody touched me. How do I know? I could feel the power of the spirit released from him within me to reach that person and stop Satan's attack on my child. It's not what Silburn said. It's what Silburn read. It's in the book. Let's take a look. This connection of becoming one with what God wants. Sorry, this connection of becoming one is what God, want, God wants. This, let me repeat that. The connection between man and the spirit of God is what God wants. This connection, the connection Jesus had. The example he set. That's what God wants with you. That's what God wants with me. You understand me? That's what he wants. He wants to fill your life and mine with his Holy Spirit so that you and I can be a witness of his love and his power. He is going to use his power, the power of the Spirit, the dynamite power of his Spirit to express his love to those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who are sick, those who are lame, those who are disenfranchised, those who are depressed, he will use the power, the dynamite power of his spirit to blow to smithereens those demons who are putting us in those situations. Oh, when we're going to understand what God requires of his church, when are we going to understand what God requires of us as the followers of Jesus? When? Let's go to the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts. We're talking about baptism of the Spirit of God. We dealt with baptism by water last week. We are going to end this week on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, for you to be born again, you've got to have two baptisms. You must be baptized by water and you must be baptized by the Spirit. Got to. You baptize by water and you ain't got the Spirit, you ain't going to heaven. You think you are the spirit, but you've been baptized by water. Chances are you could go, depending 
on if you've got the right spirit. Check this out. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Cornelius was not a Jew. He was a Roman. Good. I want you to understand that. And said Cornelius, thy, and said Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose name is Peter, for he is lodged in a house by the, he's sorry, I, I missed out, for he's lodged in a house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, let me tell you, when the Spirit speaks to you, you got to respond immediately. The little obedience is disobedience. You've heard me say that time and time again. We've got to respond to the Spirit immediately. Immediately. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Cornelius was an upright man. He was praying because he wanted to know more about God and his son Jesus Christ. He had heard things and the spirit had been working on his heart and so he was hungering and thirsting after righteousness which is what we all need to be doing today. Not hungering and thirsting after how many people died on COVID or what happened with the next train or what CNN and them talking about now. We gotta be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Only then will God reveal his truths to us. And Cornelius, a Gentile, was hungering. He was thirsting. He was panting like a deer after water for righteousness and the word of God. And God recognized his diligence and his earnestness. And he had Peter come. The Bible says in verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Ha <laughs> ha! Boy, that's a whole sermon there. That's a whole sermon there. Some people believe because they belong to a particular religion, God got them. Some people believe because they got a little money and a house and a car, and they have a little better than others, that God favors them. People, listen then. Boy, Satan has taken us and made a mess with us. God don't respect nobody. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that visiteth, that thou visiteth him? Listen, the Bible says he like the grass of the field who flourishes in the morning and withers at night. Let me tell you, we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. We've got to understand that, listen, but for the grace of God, Satan would have done a number on us. So we need to humble ourselves and realize that, you know what? All we can do to maintain favor with God is submit to his spirit, follow his son Jesus Christ, and enjoy the abundant blessings that he has provided for us here and now. So Peter opens his mouth and he says, boy, I can't finally come to realize, man, God ain't no respect our person. God loves everybody the same. Yeah. And, but in every nation, he that feareth him and work of righteousness is accepted with him. Oh, somebody need to hear that again. In every nation, in every religious denomination, you understand me? I don't care which one. It could be the church of Satan. Peter is saying here that anyone that worketh righteousness will be accepted by God. You looking at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And when he recognizes the heart, that is willing to be led by his spirit. He comes to that person. He transforms their life. And he have them separate. He said come out from among them. And be separate. Come out of her. My people. Because it is the habitation of devils. So I don't care what religion. I don't care what church. I don't care what country. I don't care who they are. If their heart is a heart. That is susceptible to the spirit of God. God will. 
Remove them and accept them. That's Bible. That's Bible. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. The water baptism. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Sickness. I don't care what kind of sickness it is. Pandemics. I don't care what year. I don't care. Lack is what the devil uses to oppress God's fallen race. You understand me? For God was with Jesus. So Jesus began to reverse the curse. Jesus came to teach you and I how to reverse the curse by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, brethren. Ah, oh, boy. Lord, help your people to understand what you're sharing with us this morning. And we are witnesses, verse 39, of all these, of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. He was reversing the curse, and the church arrested him and hung him. <laughs> Peter, making it plain. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. He went hiding. He walked around openly so people could see him because nobody could touch him now. <laughs> Praise God. Now, to all the people, but unto witness, no, sorry, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Verse 42. Oh, verse 42. The commission to the church, the commission to the Christian is articulated by Peter to Cornelius and the company of people, Gentiles that were in his house. And it reads again. And he, Jesus, has commanded us, his church, his followers, his believers, all right, to preach to people. You preach him. To testify that he which was ordained of God is to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Are we testifying? Are we busy focusing on what's happening with the coronavirus? Yeah, I'm going to hop on the coronavirus. Now I go hop on the coronavirus. Now I go hop on it because Satan has used it to take our minds off of Christ. And he has his agents out there. He has the prophets of coronavirus on Facebook and elsewhere putting stuff out there. Coronavirus this, coronavirus this, variant this, variant that. Let me tell you something. I got caught up in an argument, a discussion. I put a simple post on my page and I got caught up. And I was speaking to a friend last night. And she says, Silver, leave those people alone. They don't identify who you are by what they say on your page. They are satanic agents sent to attempt to disrupt and to, 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 to model the message God has given you to present. Ignore the ignorant. And when I use the word ignorant here, I'm using it to mean ignorant of the word of God. Put your stuff and go your way. And that's what I will endeavor to do from now. Let me tell you something. I got a hard head. Dr. Ruth Roy begged me years ago. Don't involve, don't get, don't get in these silly discussions. Other people. And I couldn't see. But I wasn't where I needed to be yet. Now I am I'm getting there. God is bringing me to a place where I'm beginning to understand that these discussions are silly. They are useless. And all they do is attempt to promote self. 
So I will continue to post my beliefs on my page. And when people come with the contradicting nonsense, I'll delete it. It's my page. We're going to present what God tells me to present. Straight up. Straight up. If they can stop people from going to restaurants and from going to church and from getting paid and from working because they choose to do things a certain way, I, Silver, can choose to have my Facebook page say what God tells me for it to say without the interruption or the coloring of other people with agendas coming on it. Straight up. Straight up. You see, so I, 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 I so that one part of my script, but God put it on my lips, I gotta say it to you. I gotta say it to you. All right? We were called to testify and to preach Christ. That's our mission. Testify and preach Christ. That's it. That's it. But fear. God has preached all kinds of different gospels. Our focus is on the things of this world. We're not cocky eye. You can't watch the world and watch Jesus at the same time. Even if it appears you are, it means there is a problem with your eyes. So you're not looking at both. You're actually looking at the same thing, but your eyes cross. Straight up. Can't do the both. All right? God has said that his son Jesus is the judge of the quick, of the living, and the dead. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. So let me tell you, all the good prophets named in the Bible, Moses, Joshua, David, uh, his son Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Nahum, Joel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, um, uh, Malachi, Peter, James, John, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you name them. They all testified, brethren, of Jesus Christ. They were witnesses. And they preached about him. They lived the life he lived. And so they became powerful witnesses. And because of their testimony, because of their witness, many people were saved. Who are you testifying about today? What are you testifying about today? Which spirit drives your testimony? Is it the spirit of the living God whose only responsibility in you is to present Christ and to use his power to show others the power available through Jesus Christ? Is that what you're testifying about? Oh! You're testifying about this and that and this and that and this and that. What is your testimony? Which spirit controls? Look at verse 44 to 48. While Peter yet spoke, haha, God says, I will be with you always. I'm not going to send you into a situation and leave you hanging. While Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost showed up. Ha -ha! Praise God. Fell on all of them that heard the word. If you heard the word, you got the spirit. Because the heart was ready. And they are the circumcision as Jews. Jews were the ones circumcised. That was the church people. The church people who came with Peter to see. Well, Gentiles? God ain't come for no Gentiles. What? Well, as Adventists? It's only we going to heaven. The Catholics not going. The Baptists not going. The Pentecostals not going. Hey! The people in the church of Satan not going. You know? The Muslims not going. The Hindus not going. It's only we going. So why are we going over to this Muslim place? What? Let's go see. The Gawkers, who came with Peter, the circumcision, the church people, which believed, were astonished. 
Church people who believe. There's a lot of people in church who believe. Let's get it straight. God's people are in every church. And they are believers. They believed. And because of their belief, they were able to see God's mighty work among the Gentiles. And they were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Were these Gentiles baptized by water? No. God reversed it. He's God. He can do what he wants. When he wants, with whomever he chooses. And when he does it, it's right. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. We're coming back to that. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Should anybody stop these people from getting baptized by water? Seeing that the Holy Ghost has already fallen upon them, they're already ready to walk after the Spirit, although the born-again experience that comes from water baptism hasn't occurred yet? Hmm? That's what Peter's asking here. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They prayed, they, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He had taught them. Then he baptized them. And then the spirit of God in them says, stick with us. Because now you're going to teach us to observe all things whatsoever Jesus has commanded us. That's Matthew 28, 18. Baptize them. Sorry. Teach them. Present Christ. When they accept Christ, you baptize them. Then you stick around. And you teach them to observe all things. That's what the Bible teaches. We got a bunch of preachers running around. With a bunch of mercenaries. They come into your town. And they hold a crusade. And they baptize you. And they're gone. Not God's way. Not God's way. Talking about the spirit. There's no spirit there. There's no spirit there. Because you're not doing it the way Jesus said. If we don't do it the way Jesus said. Then the spirit of God is not going to be there. And you know. I worked for an organization called Breath of Life. And I went to Long Beach, California with Breath of Life, a church called the Philadelphia SDA Church. And we baptized a lady by the name of Barbara Mike. She had one leg. She was in a wheelchair. Barbara Mike had a drug problem. And she cried to me. And she says, Silver, can God deliver me? I said, yes. She said, I got two daughters and four grandchildren. I haven't seen them in three years because of this drug addiction. I believe. I told the powers that be. She needed to go to rehab. They said, no, they want her in the pool so they go get their number. I said, listen, she needs to go to rehab. Stop putting the cat before the horse. When she comes back, she'll get baptized. You can get your number. No. My boss said no. The church pastor said no. He says, I'll make sure she go to rehab after you leave. I had already had a bed at a rehab in Long Beach for Barbara Mike. She was supposed to go in the Thursday. Baptism was the Saturday, the Sabbath day. Barbara Mike was held back from going to rehab the Thursday because the church pastor promised to get her there the Monday. I left him a list of the names of the people. What was required so that they could minister to them. We left that Saturday night after baptism. We left the Saturday night after baptism. Put on planes back to where we came from. I came back to New York. I was called to go with Breath of Life back to California. This time we went to Riverside, a hundred miles south. And one day, my partner Jonathan Morris and I decided we were going to go visit 
the people in Long Beach. So we went up there. When I got there, everybody was smoking crack, drinking booze, and acting the fool. When they saw Jonathan and I, they, oh, sorry, sorry, Brother Silver, sorry, Brother Jonathan. The people in the church never came on God. They had a brand new bus somebody had gifted them so they could pick up the people to bring to church. They never used it. No spirit. No spirit. And I call it names because I want you to understand it's happening in your church. You understand me? Come after me. God got me. And Barbara cried. I knelt by her wheelchair and I comforted her. I promised Barbara I was going to come back the following week to see her. That Sunday, I went for a walk along the river, the little river there in, 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 uh, where we were staying, outside Pacific Union College or whatever they call it now, I don't know. I forget the name. I was taking a walk and I got a call from a young lady who lived next to Barbara Mike. Her name was Charisma Bass. Charisma called me. She had gotten baptized too. And they never came back for her. Her story a little different. We're not going to go into that one. Charisma called me. She said, Brother Silburn, Barbara Mike overdosed on crap. She did. I said, no, she's not. He said, yes. Brother Silburn, she did. I hold her. She defecated on herself. And she think. And I said, what are you doing? She said, we call the ambulance. I took off running. I took off running. I ran all the way back. To where we were living. I woke up Jonathan. I said we got to go down to Long Beach. By the time we got to Long Beach, Barbara had not died. But she was in a coma. They had cleaned her up and she was laying in a hospital bed. She was laying in a hospital bed. Unconscious. In a coma. Jonathan and I, we spoke with her. We prayed for her. And we promised to go back and see her. Only the opportunity to go back and see her never came because she died. 66 years old. Baptized. And then a couple months later, dying on crack. We baptized them. And we do not even begin to help them understand the power of the Spirit to change their lives. I could never work for any of these organizations again. I could never, ever work for any of those preachers again. It's an abomination. Christ died for Barbara Mike. He loved her with an everlasting love. And we didn't see a loving child of Jesus's. We saw a number. Because we are devoid of the spirit. Water baptism is not enough. There must be a baptism of the spirit of the living God. We've got to stop making a mockery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way that will happen is when we allow the Spirit of God to saturate our lives, to take control of our heart and permeate our mind so that we do everything by the Spirit. Oh, Lord have mercy. Verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They prayed him to tarry with them certain days so they could be taught. So they could be taught. I call this the reverse effect. I call it the reverse effect. Instead of water baptism and then the spirit, in the case of these Romans, Cornelius and the company at his home, the spirit showed up first. They had the baptism of the spirit first and then the water baptism. In the case of the thief on the cross, he got the baptism of the spirit who revealed to him who Jesus was. He accepted him and he never got the opportunity to be water baptized. You know why? Because he died. 
and death in Christ is a baptism. When he rises again, he will be rising in newness of life. And there are people today who live lives contrary to the love and the will and the way of God. But on their deathbed, they meet Jesus. He comes to them and he changes their heart by his spirit and then they die. The reverse effect. Paul talks about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go there. We're talking about baptism of the Spirit. It doesn't matter when you get the baptism of the Spirit. Just make sure you get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported, verse 1. Commonly, that there is fornication among you and such fornication that is not so much as named among the Gentiles. He's talking about the church. He said the fornication taking place in the church is worse than what's taking place in the Gentiles, among the Gentiles who don't know God. All right? That one man should be with his father's wife. And you are so haughty and arrogant and puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. One rotten apple contaminated the whole barrel of apples. So you got to take it out. For I verily, as absent in body, I'm not there with you in Corinth, but present in spirit, but the spirit of God that resides in me is with you too, because he can be everywhere, and he speaks to you, and he speaks to me. So I already know what's going on. That's what Paul is saying here. I have judged already, and though I were, as though, sorry, as though I were present, Concerning him that have done such a deed. Check this out. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you come together. And my spirit. Which the, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is his spirit and the spirit of Christ. Okay. He said when we come together with my spirit. Paul's spirit and the spirit of Christ. We're going to pray to deliver such a one unto Satan <laughs> for the destruction of the flesh. Why? The flesh profited nothing. It's got to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to go back to dust. It has to go back to dust so you can be housed in your new tent, in your new body, your new glorified body. you got to understand what Paul is saying here. He said we want to pray. That God turned him over to Satan to kill him. And while he died. You understand me? That he may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So while he died. The spirit will touch his heart. He will surrender. And the spirit will possess him. And he will die. In Christ. And be saved. That's scripture. It's not what Silburn said. It's what Silburn read. It's in the book. Take a look. Let the Spirit give you understanding. You see? The Holy Spirit possessed others before and after they were baptized. Some people were possessed with the Spirit after baptism and some people, as just read here, were possessed after Oh, before, sorry, some of you, you and I, we got baptized, spirit take over. Some people, as we just read in John chapter, Acts chapter 10, were possessed by the spirit after, or before, sorry, before, before baptism. All right, and this is to confirm to them that the faith of Jesus Christ will come. I mean, your faith in Jesus Christ, sorry, will bring the Spirit of God to you when He, the Spirit, sees fit. Not when we assume it's going to come. You see, God don't depend on man to do what He's doing. God's going to do what He's doing because He understands the situation man is in. And He just wants to save him. You know, we try to put God in a box. Well, this has to happen first. That has to happen second. That has to happen third. Now, nah, God don't work so. God's ways are not our ways. You see? So we have to understand that. But upon these Gentiles, it occurs before they were baptized by water to show that God does not 
confine himself to outward signs. Yeah? God don't confine himself to our ways, our understanding, our chronological order. He's God. Allow him to be God. And allow him to do what he's going to do in your life without running your mouth. Just be quiet and submit. The Holy Spirit fell upon those who were neither circumcised or baptized. In those days, the Christian church, the Jewish church, said you have to be circumcised. God said, that's the old way. Now my son has come, I want to circumcise your heart, not your foreskin. So they weren't neither circumcised, nor were they baptized by water. It is the spirit that quickeneth or gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. That's John 6, 63, Jesus speaking. They magnify God. That's where we're going now. Remember I say we'll come back to that? They magnify God. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10. I want to go back to it because this is important, brethren. It's very important. Acts chapter 10. It says they magnified God. 46. It says... For they heard them speak with tongues. That's a thing, big thing nowadays. Everybody speaking in tongues. What do you say? You know what I'm saying? You just wrap it up, deep which you not even you understanding what you say. You see? It says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. An indication that who heard them realized what they were saying. They were magnifying God. You see? They were magnifying God. They magnify God and speak of Christ and the power and blessings of redemption. Their speaking in tongues was glorifying God. They were speaking about the power of God to change their lives. The blessings they were already receiving from God. And the power and the blessings of redemption. They knew they were redeemed. As on the day of Pentecost... This was no ordinary miracle. No mere speaking gibberish with no meaning and understanding, but utterances of the wonderful works of God in languages unknown to them that spoke it. Go to Acts chapter 2 verse 11. Acts chapter 2 verse 11. The Christians and the Arabians and the people from by time uh, from Pamphylia and Egypt and Libya and Cyrene and Rome and the Jews and the proselytes, all these people, they say we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. So tongue speaking is a way of presenting God to people who don't speak the same tongue you speak. That's what the Bible teaches. The people from all these places heard the disciples speaking in their tongue, telling them the greatness of God. Tongues is not for you to be rolling around on the floor, jumping around like a clown. Eh? Frothing from the mouth, speaking gibberish. What you just say? You don't know. That's a mockery. God don't do nothing for sure. He don't do nothing for sure. In this case, these Gentiles were not familiar with the Old Testament songs of praise. So what they said was solely spirit inspired and not religious teachings. These weren't Jews who had songs of Solomon and the Psalms. They did not have the songs of, of, of Deborah. You see? They were Gentiles. That was nothing to do with them. It was not a part of their culture. So when they began to magnify God and began to speak in tongues and they began to present songs of praise and words of adoration, it was not religious teachings that they were regurgitating. It was spirit-inspired words that brought praise and glory to God. Somebody need to say hallelujah. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, 17 to 21. We're back to submission again. You say, you know, I say you almost get sick and tired of me talking about submission. But let me tell you, Christian life is one of submission. And we ain't get it yet. We still think we got to do something. So, when you are baptized, you have to learn to submit daily. You got to die. 
daily. To die means to submit to something greater than yourself. The Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 5, let's go from verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is, and be not drunk with wine within is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves. Submission is important. You submit to each other as they show you Christ in them. You submit to the Christ in the person because you're going to do it in the fear. The honor, the respect, the reverence of God. That's what the Bible teaches. Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Ephesians, Gal Galatians, Ephesians. And we're going to read 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When you do these things, no law could take you down. There is no penalty to pay. Hallelujah. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And it's manifested by joy in your heart. Peace in your soul. Long-suffering for your fellow man. Gentleness in dealing with situations that could cause you to rise up and rile up. Goodness to those who are not good to you. Uh, faith in God that he will see you through. Meekness, humility, which is the first step to the Christian experience. Temperance, we ask the Spirit to show us how much to use, how much to do, when to do it, and direct and, and, and follow his direction. Temperance, and against these, there is no law. These passages of Scripture, brethren, tell us what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. If you want to know what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, don't go to the Pentecostal church. Go to the Word. Go to the Word. Go to Ephesians 5, 17 to 21, and to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. All right? We have seen that being filled with God's Spirit is not, all, is not at all like what many Christian churches portray to us today. It is not primarily an emotion an ecstatic experience or a verbal regurgitation of gibberish. But rather, it is knowing and obeying the will and the word of God as taught throughout Scripture. These passages here denote submission to the will of God, which can only be done by the Spirit of God in you and I. Woo! I'm going to repeat that. We have seen that being filled with the Spirit of God is not all is not at all like what many Christian churches portray to us today. It is not an emotion. It's not an ecstatic experience. You ain't having sex. It is a it is not a verbal regurgitation of gibberish, but rather it is knowing and obeying the will of the word of God as taught throughout scripture. These passages here denote sus submission to the will of God, which can only be done by the spirit of God in you and I. These scriptures are evidencing the fruit produced in you and I by the spirit. You've got to produce the fruit. If the spirit is in you, his fruit must be manifested and the spirit fruit of the Spirit is love. Love breeds forgiveness. Love breeds sharing. Love breeds caring. Ephesians 5.18 and if Galatians 5.22 and 23 sings to our heart. Ephesians 5.19 gives thanks always for all things. 
Ephesians 5, 21 propels us to be like Jesus, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We are to submit to each other, be servants to each other, only as far as the will of God allows. We should not serve others in their efforts to cheat the poor or hide the truth or kill the innocent. We must always serve the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6. So our submission, our service must always be to him, housed in each other. Our service to God must always be to you and to others as Jesus did to those to whom he ministered. Jesus modeled this perfectly. He came to be a servant and was, but about half of his ministry was spent standing up to those who abused their power. He cleansed the temple. He rebuked the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. He corrected false ideas and false teachings. In other words, being submissive to one another does not include being submissive to those who are working against the will of God. That's the limitations. We are to follow the example of servitude. Jesus said, after all, we are baptized into him, we are in him, and he is in us. That's what the Bible teaches us. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. For as many of you as are baptized, water baptized, spirit baptized, into Christ, have put on Christ. Galatians 2.20 For we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not us, but Christ living in us. And the life we now live in the flesh, we live by faith. The Spirit of God provides the faith. In the Son of God. So when you are water baptized and you are spirit baptized, you do it the way Jesus did. Because the same spirit that propelled him on earth to live successfully and victoriously. The same spirit that gave him the power to heal, to raise the dead, to feed thousands and do wonderful works. is the same spirit that's available to you and I today. And the Bible tells us in these last days, Jesus, uh, the prophet Joel is speaking and uh, the, the, the evangelist Peter repeating, in these last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your young men shall dream dreams, and your handmaidens shall see visions, and they shall prophesy. In the name of Jesus, I beseech you, brethren, to understand water baptism is not enough. Spirit baptism is not what you see. Spirit baptism is what the Bible tells us it is. And the Bible made it very clear in Galatians 5, 17 to 21. And, I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 17 to 21. And Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Take those scriptures seriously. Read them carefully. Ask the Spirit to give you understanding. And go about by that Spirit, living the power of God unto salvation. So those who see you will see Christ in you and come to know him. And accept him. Heavenly Father, baptize us anew with power from on high. And help us, Lord, as we start this week to start it walking after the Spirit and not after our flesh. May our flesh be mortified and may our new life in Christ rise and be perpetuated in all that we do and say. Be with each of us. Bless us. Keep us and grant us a wonderful day and a pleasant week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May God bless you. At this time, we're going to pray our closing hymn. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy call. Praise God. I'm going to take a look and see who is with us.
Sister Marianne Alexander. Good to have you, Sister. Good morning. KB St. Lucia, Alban and Company. Thanks for joining us, my brother and friends. Give my regards to your staff, Jan, and the rest of the people there. Magdalene Agdoma, welcome. My cousin, Sherma Felix, welcome there. We gotta catch up real soon. Anthony Marshall, Thea Charles, Lon Jules, welcome guys. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, who else? The Bronx is in the house, yes. I know there are more of you, but my phone is not showing me. Let me see. from Montserrat. Welcome guys. Debbie, down there St. Lucia having a blast. Blessings. Stephen Reynolds. Blessings brother. Martin Blass. Blessings brother. Brenda Samuel. Keisha Coleman. Down there in Maryland. My dear sister, how are you? Blessings to you. Dr. Joyce Lynn Fletcher. Welcome there. Anastasia Augustine, welcome my beloved. Blessings to you all. Maggie Agdoma, Frida Richardson, Al Vincent Hudson, welcome. Welcome to you all. Welcome to you all. Cici Lou, Cecilia Louison, and Irvin. Blessings. Tony and Sarah, blessings to you both. Hear a blessed move to the cross where thou hast stood. Draw me nearer, near a blessed move to thy precious bleeding you all. 